we're going to talk today about Judas. You know, as, as I study scripture, sometimes I just get really interested in one story or one character, and Judas has really captured my attention for the last couple of months, just learning about Judas. And as I started to really delve into study, I realized we don't say a whole lot about Judas, mostly that he's a bad guy and you don't want to be like Judas. So this is not an inspirational, let's find some good from Judas's life, but rather let's really look at what Judas did and, and how he ended up in the position he ended up in. Do any of you have like a relative that you don't want to acknowledge, like an aunt or an uncle that you hope? No, I'm just kidding. That's not appropriate. No, but a relative that you feel like, you know, we just don't talk about that guy. A lot of the time, that's kind of how it is about Judas. We'll hear inspirational stories about the rest of the disciples. When it comes to Judas, it's a quick overview of what he did at the end of his life, and that's kind of it. So I really wanted to know, how could somebody so close to Christ betray him the way he did? And so I think that there are some lessons from his life that we can learn. So Judas was the only Judean disciple. All of the rest of the disciples were from Galilee. It was a common name in that era. I probably would not suggest it for your child now. But back then, Judas was a pretty common name. It's the Greek form of Judah or Jehovah leads. And so his parents, when he was born, wanted to give him a name. Remember, in biblical times, names really meant something. They wanted to give him a name that would indicate how he would live his life. And they gave him a name that means Jehovah or God leads. Iscariot, the next name, is Greek for apokaryotu. That just means he's from Kerioth. That's the city he was from. Kerioth is 23 miles south of Jerusalem. So you go uh, about three miles south of Jerusalem, you're going to run right into Bethlehem. You know what happened there? Go about 21 miles south of that, and you're going to run into Kerioth, a very small town, a rural farmland town. That's where he was from. So when we look at the Cedar Valley, he would have been more likely to come from a small rural farming town than he would have been Waterloo or Cedar Falls. This is where he was from. So we're going to look at John chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. We're going to read one of the most common stories told about Judas here in Scripture. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. If you look it up on your app, flip to it in Scripture. Or it'll be up here on the screen for you to follow along. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So here, first of all, when you read this scripture, you probably have the question that I've had, and I, I just had to find an answer to, what is nard? And so it's from a flower that probably smells like lavender. That's the best that we know about it. And so that, just in case that nagging question was going to bother you the rest of service, because I'm like, what did his feet smell like? Maybe it smelled bad. And Judas is just trying to be polite. But no, it smelled good. It was lavender. And so here he has a role. The first thing we can see about Judas is he fulfilled his role without a good reason. He fulfilled his role without a good reason. Judas had this important job. He was the treasurer, the keeper of the money bag. He was CFO of Jesus' nonprofit, and it was his job to control the money, yet he would steal it. He heard sermons from the Son of God. So he's sitting at a table with Jesus. He's in a room with Jesus. He's on a, a mountainside with Jesus, the Son of God. And he's saying things like, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where thieves break in and steal, and he is a thief. And see, Judas never denied the deity of God. You might think that you could betray someone that you don't have faith in. Hear me, he did not lack faith, he lacked obedience. And a lot of times we measure our lives by the faith that we have. 
instead of the obedience that we walk in. Judas was a man of great faith with very little obedience. It's also proof on a side note that the condition of your heart actually has very little to do with the leader you sit under. How you honor your boss at work has very little to do with your boss. How you honor your leadership in church has very little to do with the leadership in church. You know this, there have been different men and women of God in this pulpit for years, has very little to do with them. How you honor each other in your home, in your marriage, with your children, has very little to do with the people you're around. How do I know that? Because Judas sat under Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, who knew all things he sat under his leadership and still found a problem with him. It was the condition of his heart. See, when you fill a role and you don't know the reason, you're going to burn out. For every role you fill, whether it's wife or father, business owner, farmer, your mom, whatever, if you don't have a good reason for why you do that, fulfilling the role is going to become a burden. You know, I had this job in high school. It was at a place called Meyer. It's like a super store. I don't know. You don't have them in Iowa. Maybe you know it. They're great stores. It's like the original super Walmart. And so I had a job there, and it was bagging groceries, clearing the lot of shopping carts, um, you know, like cleaning the bathrooms, basically like, um, I don't know what they would have called it, which tells you how committed I was to it, because I don't even, I worked there for five years, and I don't know what the title was of my role. I just know this. I would go into the clock, and I would swipe my card, because I'm old. (laughs) We didn't have computers and badges. So I'd pull my card out and swipe it. And then I would go to the manager and say, what do I do today? And she would say, this is where we have you. You're bagging at these lanes. You're cleaning bathrooms, whatever she wanted me to do. And I did it because I wanted money. (laughs) I did not care about the company at all. All those years there, I could not tell you their strategic plan, their long-term vision. I did not care because my one reason for having that job was not like, I just want to make Meyer look good. I want to bag those groceries, and I just realized this is on YouTube. And if somebody sees it, look, I was 16, but I did not really care about making Meyer look good. I just did what I was supposed to do with minimal effort, okay? So, like, what... How do you clean the bathroom? Here's the list of what you're supposed to do. Or you could just clean the handles on the doors because that's where they could see the fingerprints and then just spray the stuff that smells clean. So if they did check, they would open the door and say, oh, it smells clean in here. It was not clean, but I did not care because my reason was money. And so listen, when I got more money at a different job, I quickly walked away. Your reason will determine how faithful you're going to be in a position. Really, I wasn't inspired by the company vision because I clocked in and I clocked out like a lot of people do in their Christian faith. I come in on the Sundays that it works for me and I swipe my card and I sit on the pew and then when service is over, I clock out there, did it, God noticed that, put it on my timesheet, I was here and then I go back out and I don't apply the word and I don't change my life and what happens is I become all about the role, I have to go to church, it's the right thing to do, my wife makes me come, my husband makes me come, my mom, my dad, they make me come, I come all about the role and I become indifferent about the reason, and then I grow bitter, just like Judas. Because when you serve the role and not the people, you open your heart up to that same bitterness. I know that it can seem severe, like um, none of us are going to betray Christ. But you have to remember that when Jesus sat at a table with his disciples and said, one of you is going to do this, none of them thought that it was them. When he said, you're the one, nobody jumped up and said, wait, what? No, let's stop him. (laughs) They just kept eating. Like silly Jesus and his prophecies. They didn't take it seriously. So here's a checklist for our hearts to examine. Do I care more about the role than I do the reason? Here's, Here's one thing. And this is from 20 years of ministry. People threaten to quit or they actually quit when they get offended with people. So so so-and-so, I don't like how they talk to me. I'm done. This happened, I'm out of here. 
They quit when they get offended because they're about the role instead of the reason. And so rather than work through that offense, rather than let iron sharpen iron, rather than follow biblical principles, they step back and say, I'm out of here. That person crossed me. Listen, when the enemy knows that offense will get you to quit, you're going to live always offended because he's never going to back down from that. When he knows if I offend that person, they apply, apply biblical principles, they put it into practice, that relationship gets stronger. What should have broken them made them stronger. Hear me, when he knows if an offense is going to make you bitter at your husband or wife, he's going to keep you offended. But instead, if it builds your communication, it builds you, it strengthens your marriage, the enemy is going to say, I don't want that. That actually worked against me and not for me. So he's interested in what he wants. Second, they have a favor mentality. Well, I don't really want to, but they really need me. Well, I guess as a favor, I I suppose, I mean, it's not really my thing, but if nobody else will do it, it's this favor. And listen, then you're serving whatever event, whatever thing. If your boss says, will you come in early? I guess as a favor, when you have that mentality, hear me, what happens is they owe you because you did a favor. And they're never going to pay up. And you're going to get bitter because you did them a favor and they didn't acknowledge it. But hear me, a good leader isn't going to see it as a favor. A good leader is going to see it as your development. And here's the real truth. Sometimes we think we're doing a favor for somebody because what they've asked of us is so beneath where we think we are. So I guess I'm here, but if you really need me to, I'll do a favor and I'll serve at this level. I'll teach this class. I'll do this thing. Even though it's way beneath me, I guess I'll enter those numbers for my boss, even though I that's really her job, but I guess I'll do it. It's so beneath me I have this favor mentality when what we don't always realize is what the leader sees in us is that it's not beneath us it's right where we really are we just don't know it and so it's really an opportunity to develop so a good leader is going to say hey you need developed in this area here's a task that matches what you need let's put them together and they know this is a gift to you that's your blessing that's your gift this is for you but when you think no it's for you (laughs) I'm doing you a favor then you get your wires crossed and you get bitter. Listen, years and years ago, our pastor's wife at our home church went on vacation. She called me on like a Thursday or Friday. Hey, I need you to teach Sunday school this Sunday morning, the middle school kids, because you know them, you like these kids, and nobody else will do it. That's really how it went. It wasn't like a, you're so great. It was like a, nobody else will touch these kids with a 10-foot pole, middle schoolers. I love you. Not everybody thinks you're easy to love at that stage. So she was like, please take this Sunday school class. So I went in there thinking it was one Sunday. But then she came back from vacation and she handed me the packet for the next Sunday. And I was like, this is kind of weird because I thought that I wasn't doing it two Sundays. So I just did it because I didn't want to speak up and be like, wait, are, 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 you seem like you're back though. And I thought it was a one time thing. So I did it. And then the next week I did it. And I probably did it for four to six weeks. And I was like, this is getting super weird. And I was replaying our initial conversation and I did not misunderstand. She definitely asked me to do one Sunday. And I was like, why? Why does she keep giving me the lessons every week? But I knew I had in my head what she said. Nobody else wants to do this. And so I was like, I don't, I don't want to either. I don't want to either because these kids are, it's first thing in the morning and most of them don't want to be there and they definitely don't brush their teeth. And it is not my, like the room would fill in this back corner with their morning breath and the kids would be, you'd be like, what's the answer? (sighs) Get me out of here. I don't want to be in here. There was a whole Sunday where all the whole time I was teaching, they were just trying to throw cheeses into each other's mouths. SOS. I don't want to do this. So I finally went to her and said, hey, so this last packet you gave me is like for the next month, and you seem like you've been back from vacation a while. Like, is this a permanent thing? And she looked at me and said, you could use some strengthening in the area of teaching, and I thought this would be a good opportunity for you. Now, I could have chosen at that point to get offended because I'd actually been teaching a while. My job at the time was to teach. And so I was like, what? <laughs> I do this for a living. But I, I thought to myself, this is not beneath me. 
this is an area of identified need. And she found an opportunity that met, matched where I needed to be developed. And she gave it to me. Can I tell you from that Sunday on, it wasn't a favor to her that I was in that classroom. It was a gift to me to be developed, to be strengthened, to be, because you know what she had identified? I was good at talking to people that wanted to be there. But I needed to be stretched and talking to people that didn't. That served me really well in youth ministry. And so when we have a favor mentality, I'm doing it for them. What happens is they owe us when it should be the other way around. Another thing is we like to stick it to people by saying no. That's how we know we're all about the role. Oh, well, let's see how you do without me. Let's see if you don't want to do it. Now, listen, you know I don't cook very good, but I sure give it the old try every night. And my family knows this when they start to say, like the other day, I made a BLT. <laughs> I, the kitchen was pretty smoky. <laughs> I was like, <"Ooh." laughs> it's cold, but whatever. And so some of the bacon got more done the, than others, but really on the safe side, you don't want raw bacon. That could be sickening to you. So yeah, it was crispy. I've heard him order it crispy. So I give him the BLT, and I'm watching him eat it, and maybe he had the more burnt pieces because they were really black. But I thought he'll be fine. So I give it to him. He takes a bite, and I'm watching his face, and I'm like, how is it? And he says, you know it's burnt, right? It was well done. That's how it's ordered. I don't know if it's burnt. But then I said what I'm always going to say, which is, but if you want to make dinner... <laughs> Go ahead. I know every wife in the room is like, oh my gosh, no, really. Look, if you want to make dinner, then maybe we both wouldn't be so hungry. Because as it turns out, two nights later, this man who I have been married to for 21 years and never seen him make bacon ever in my life, I come home and guess what he's made for himself? Bacon, perfectly done. <laughs> and he says this, this is what it's supposed to taste like. That's brave, right? <laughs> That's brave. But, but this is the thing. You stick it to them when you say, try to do it without me. Just see. They'll see how hard it is. They'll see how much I do behind the scenes. He'll feel it. She'll feel it. They'll know. If I call in sick, this place is going to fall apart. Listen, that's an all about me. That's a favor mentality. That's all about the role. When instead you say, I'm so committed to the success of wherever I am. That my prayer is that they excel when I'm not there, not the other way around. It's all about God and not about what people say and do. Secondly, he valued rules over relationship. Traditions over people. You see in this story, Judas really didn't care about the woman. He didn't care about her reason. He cared about how it affected him. And so she's pouring this pure nard, this, this lavender-type flower perfume on Jesus' feet. And he's sitting there thinking, I could have stolen some of that money probably. That's what Scripture tells us. He doesn't stop and say, hey, why are you doing that? What's prompting this worship? What's your story? What makes you want to worship God this way? He's focused on the rules. My pastor friend said the other day, an offended mind reveals your heart. Let me say that again. An offended mind reveals your heart. As a parent, you probably have rules. And as sure as the day is long, your kids are going to break them. They will. So we raised our kids to, you know, just like most of you, in church, right from wrong. And you don't know our daughter, Isa, hardly at all. She's only been able to visit here a couple of times, but she is a delight and was such an easy kid to parent. Like just the most that we maybe had to say to her when she was really young was, Isabella Maria, tears for days. I'm so sorry. Super soft heart. Love the Lord. And so her and Javi are in this Christian school, and she's in first grade, and Javi's in pre-K four class. And I'm at work, and I get a call from the principal. And he says, hey, I need you to come to the school. Your child was involved in an altercation, and because he's not here, I can just say, I was like, Javi, what do you do? 
And he says, no, I have Isa in my office. And I just phoned down, drove across town because I just knew somebody had done something terrible to Isa to be involved in an altercation. What did they do to my child? So I come in the office and I'm like, baby, what's wrong? And she's standing there <laughs> like still, you know, when they can't talk to you and they're just crying and it's like they can't catch their breath. And she's like, <laughs> I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Why are you sorry? What happened to you? And then this is the story. She had a best friend who was Indian, <laughs> different than the other kids in the school. And she really had an affection for this boy because everyone was really mean to him. He wet his pants a lot. She remembered this when I brought it up to her and said, hey, I want to tell that story in church. And she said, oh, yeah, the kid that wet his pants all the time. So we're not going to say his name for you two. But he wet his pants a lot. And so the other kids were really mean to him. But she really had a fondness for this fella that, you know, other kids are mean to him. I'm going to share the love of Christ. And this is the thing. When you get all about the rules... <laughs> and you forget relationship, you start to overlook someone's pure motive because you don't like their behavior. So she just felt sorry for this fellow that kids were mean to, and then there came a day where he went to take a drink from the water fountain. And the timing was just perfect. Issa was standing on a chair adjusting something, and another kid said to this boy that he couldn't drink out of the water fountain because he was dirty, because his skin was brown. So Issa did what every good Christian girl should do and jumped off the chair across the room and tackled the kid that said it. And they never saw her come in. <laughs> and she was screaming. And the teacher could barely get her pulled off. And she was screaming, don't be mean to my friend. <laughs> but it took everything in her to do that. And so the principal's telling me the story. And he's kind of trying not to laugh because she's so hysterical. I'm just going to tell you this whole story because it's so funny. So as I'm talking to him, he stops in the middle of the story, and I said, you seem so familiar to me. And he said, you do too. And as we continue talking, it turns out that he was the principal at the elementary school my brother and I attended. <laughs> and this one wasn't me. He stopped to show me the scar on his finger from when my brother bit him. <laughs> so I was like, I promise you we're not all degenerates here. Because <laughs> I was like, yeah, I totally understand she shouldn't have done that between me and you when she's not in the room. Like, high five, good job, kid. Like, stand up for those that don't have a voice. And that's when he's like, I feel like I know you. <laughs> this feels familiar. But here's the thing. On our drive home, we definitely had a talk about, you know, not attacking people like that, showing the love of Christ. But really this, in harnessing that compassion in our heart. I love that you saw that kid that nobody else saw. I love that you saw. And so when we got home, she's like, how long am I gr grounded? You're not. You're not. Because the relationship in your heart is more important to me. Now listen, you might be sitting there saying, oh my gosh, that parenting. Don't worry about it. She's fine. She's an adult. We get a pass. She turned out great. But, but the thing is, I had a choice in that moment. What am I going to emphasize? And when you're all about the rules... <laughs> You forget that most of leadership is discerning which is the greatest should. Let me say that again. Judas was focused on what Jesus should have done instead of the greater should. Leadership is just weighing two shoulds and which is greater, which is more important. So when you find yourself saying he should have done that, she should have done this, in truth, you're probably right. They should have. But maybe they had a greater should that they were responding to in that moment. So the perfume should have been sold and the money given to the poor. He's not wrong. That would have been great. And the conversation stops right there a lot of the time. He should have done that. And then we have people over and we say, mm, I don't know. I don't want to bring this up. But didn't you think it was weird that she didn't? And then he should have done that. And they say, yeah, he should have. That should have happened. And then you're out at the corner cafe with your coffee, and he should have done that. And then you're at work, and, and your boss walks by, and, oh, they're gone. Shut the door. Don't you think it's weird? Shouldn't he have done that? Yes, he should have done that. And that's where the conversation ends a lot. That's where the breakdown happens, is people stop at the first should. And they don't push through to the greater should, because they don't have enough 
of a relationship with God to understand. Hear me. The same sun, I heard this quote the other day, and it so just rattled around in my heart. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Let me say it again. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Hear this. Sun melts wax at 700 degrees, but wax hardens at 275. Having just enough of God is going to harden your heart, not soften it. Having just enough of God to know the rules without real relationship is going to harden your heart, not soften it. Knowing just enough about people from the outside is going to harden your heart towards them, not soften it. When all you know is rules and no relationship, it's always going to be a burden. How many of you have ever had like a teacher in school or a boss and you just knew This person does not care about me. They're all about the rules. And it does not bring out the best in you. Hear me. God is not that way. And when we treat him like a teacher or a boss or a leader that doesn't care about us, and we don't pursue a relationship with him, we rob ourselves of that experience of that softening. You know, when you're not ready to change your behavior, I read this the other day, accountability feels like an attack. When you're determined, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. There's nothing, they don't understand me. They don't know what I've been through. They don't know why I am this way. They don't know, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Judas sitting at the table with Jesus, you're gonna do this. I'm fine. Accountability feels personal. How dare you put your hand on that thing that I don't want to change? It hardens the wax instead of softening the clay. It really does. Offense was Judas's justification. Look at what happened in this scripture. He's sitting in this room and he sees this happen and he says, that's wrong. <laughs> that, that shouldn't have happened. That money should have been sold. And then he who knows scripture so well fulfills it himself in betraying Christ. Offense will cause you to feel justified to sell anyone out, yourself included. Hear me. When you get so focused on the rules, you open yourself up to offense because nobody can keep the rules. There is none righteous, no, not one. Yourself included. So what happens when you become all about the rules is not only do you project that on other people, but you have it in your own heart, that that's all God cares about. So when you have a bad day, when you mess up, when you stumble and fall, you think that's it. You've sold the farm. It's over. There's no mercy. There's no grace. There's no supernatural love. You live under that constant feeling like a failure. And hear me, that will burn you out fast. It's about the relationship and not the rules. Point three, he cared about the easy reward over the real reward. How many of you are planners? Like if you go on vacation, you've got it planned. Oh, we could travel together. We could. Oh, Karen, as soon as I said that's like me, I don't want to (laughs) travel. I don't want to travel with you. Because we are not really planners. We're not. And when we've traveled with people that are, it's like, oh, we should have asked this about each other before we went on this trip. Because when we're on vacation especially, but kind of how we live our life is a little more free-spirited. And so, for instance, we just drove down to Atlanta um, and then Florida. In case you didn't know, we were gone like nine days and in a car, a car with five seats and five adults and all the luggage like almost 60 hours of those nine days. And then we stayed in an RV with seven of us, seven adults. So if you really want to be on a fun vacation, help us, let us help you plan it. It's a party. But we had so much fun in this tight space, but we're driving down and people would ask, where are you stopping for the night? And we're like, how do we know <laughs> when, when we get tired or whatever, wherever we are. <laughs> and so at one point, Oscar I think it had fallen asleep or was on his phone, and and I hit something in the road that I saw, but I had no time to react. And honestly, it was such a small thing. I thought it would be fine. But, like, I saw it, but not in time to react so that you don't think I hit it on purpose. That was not what happened. But when I hit it, he instantly is like, oh, 
get over to the side of the road, which was a good call because it turns out I had blown out our tire. And so while he was putting the donut on, I'm calling around to trying to Google um, where is the closest tire shop. And it's New Year's Eve, and most of them are closing in like an hour. And we're in the middle of nowhere, so I'm talking to this guy on the phone. He said, where are you? And I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know. Well, what's the last city you passed? I don't know. I was driving. I didn't pay attention. Well, can you Google? No, my maps isn't working. I don't know where you are. And so he's like, well, ma'am, I don't know how to help you when you don't know where you're at. And then he said, did you have a map or like a plan of where you were going to stop or how close you were to that? Like he was really trying. I was like, none of those things. My husband's changing the tire real quick. Give me something I can say to him so this seems less like it's my fault. <laughs> there was nothing. I was like, he gets back in. I'm like, I have no idea where we are, what we're going to do. So we, we found a tire shop. It actually was totally the Lord's provision. In the middle of nowhere, one tire shop open for like 30 more minutes had the exact tire we needed. God will take care of you. But we, we kind of live in this space of like, we don't really know. We're not planners. And so... You know, when big, important things maybe, but we're more, if, if you don't know this about us, we got married in 11 days. Like, we're just not planners. We just kind of do things. And so being short-sighted is, it works for us. Like, we just more carefree. Not for everybody. But when it comes to spiritual things, it will not serve you well to be short-sighted. It will not. And Judas was definitely short-sighted. So he sells Jesus out for money. Think about it. It's about $3,000 in today's value, maybe 600 then, for the price of a slave. Exodus 21, 32 tells us if the bull gores a man or female, male or female slave, the owner must pay 30 shekels of silver to the master of the slave, and the bull is to be stoned to death. He sold Jesus for what he would sell a slave for. That's... That's really pretty insulting when you think about it. If somebody came and offered to buy somebody that you loved for the price of a slave, I hope you would tell them no. But he does this, and then now let's look Matthew 27, verse 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. Early in the morning, guys, this is the day after he betray Jesus. Verse 2. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse, returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That is your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left then he went away and hanged himself. So he does this huge act of betrayal. Then when he sees scripture fulfilled, which he knew what was going to happen, that Jesus was going to be condemned, he's instantly sorry. I don't know if you've ever done something in your life and instantly been sorry, like, oh, that was a, a really bad idea. Instantly sorry, instantly feels guilty. And this is the thing. He was so focused on that temporary reward, that 30 pieces of silver, that he totally forgot about eternity. Our daily choices a lot of times feel small, but it's the sum of our small choices that make up our life. So that one bowl of ice cream, no big deal. 600 bowls of ice cream later, maybe a bigger deal. It's those small things, right? It's those little things. It's the temporary in our life that often feels immediate, but it's the eternal that's important. And so what happens is this, the immediate in our life, that, that immediate need, that urgent need often crowds out what is really important. And we find ourselves compromising in ways we'll regret. If you are a parent at all, you can understand this because you can have a plan for how the night's going to go or a weekend or a trip or whatever. But then your child who's demanding, so I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. You sometimes just deal with that immediate need. And then you get to the end of the day and you say things like, I didn't get anything done today. I didn't get, because that immediate was crowding out what you thought was important. Listen, this happens in spiritual things all of the time. We enjoy the immediate without really thinking about the eternal. It looks like this. I'm going to enjoy the fruit of someone else's labor without ever putting the effort in to own the result. 
Hear me, it's like this. I'm going to walk in on Sunday, and I'm going to hope that there's a really good service and that people are there and church goes well. I'm going to hope that there's a good person who loves my kids in the nursery and kids' church is great and worship is good. And, but my actual investment, well, I'm here, aren't I? I don't own the result. I don't own whether or not Rhinebeck ever comes through these doors. See, because I'm here to enjoy the fruit. Hear me, I'm not trying to condemn you, but this is a reality check that Judas was along for the ride and didn't even know it. And when it came time to put the effort in that the rest of the disciples were going to do, go and make disciples of all the world, Judas was checked out because he was all about the temporary reward instead of the eternal result. I can't think of anything more sobering than the realization that I have invested my life in something that won't last and forgotten what would. And so here's the thing. Short-sightedness makes things feel like they're going to last forever that are temporary. And it makes eternity feel very far away. When in reality, eternity is far closer than we think. And that's what we're living for. And so the things of this earth can't hold our attention so much that we miss out on what's eternal. Really good things. Let me say this again. Judas wasn't arguing for evil things. He wasn't saying that money should have been sold, so, or you should have sold that perfume so I could steal the money. He said, you should have sold that perfume so we could give the money to the poor. We missed Sunday morning because our kids had a sporting event. Sounds like a good thing. Only weeks of that lead to months of that, lead to years of that, lead to adults who say, I come when I can, when it works for me. And hear me, maybe their family will be impacted with the gospel, maybe not. I couldn't tell you for certain, but I can tell you for certain this, that if they're not owning the result, if they're not buying in, and how would they if they're there once a month, once every two months, once every three or four weeks, if they're not owning the result, that years down the line, people are not going to look around and say, I I'm just going to say it, I'm in heaven because of you. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty important to me, that the people that I love and know and rub shoulders with are in heaven. And that can't happen if I don't take responsibility, because if I don't, she doesn't, he doesn't, and you don't, and they don't, and who does? And so that's a huge part of what we do at the center every day. We talk about the Lord. We pray with every client. Recently, I was in a particularly awkward client conversation. Some are just smooth, and it just goes like, wow, this is such a great connection. And some are less open. And so that's when they call me usually. And so when, when a staff or volunteer calls me and says, hey, do you have a second? That's code for SOS. So I came in, and I could see by the look on the staff's face, like, good luck here. And so I start talking to this gentleman and this gal about their choice and just kind of sharing um, from my heart, letting them share from theirs. And there was a brick wall. And so I said at the end, we're faith-based here. And we offer prayer to every client. And it's totally up to you whether you want it or not. It's completely up to you. And I knew in my heart they were going to say, no, we don't want prayer. And they said, no, we don't want prayer. And they left. And I had a little time of introspection. And I thought, why offer it if they're going to say no? And I felt the Holy Spirit say so clearly, so that you will know you offered it. Stop judging by the fruit of what happens and just start owning the effort, family. Listen, it's easy to say, I can't relate to Judas at all. But I don't know about you. If I'm really candid, when I look at the lives of the disciples, when I look at not the betrayal side of what Judas did to Christ, but the questioning, the wondering, the saying, wait, what's happening? What's going on? Um, the all about the rules because the structure feels safe and comfortable, it's not so hard to relate to him after all. And what that tells me is this. If we don't guard our hearts, we can grow bitter even when we didn't think we could. We can grow weary and well-doing. 
If the worship team would come back up, I want to read to you this quote from Klaus Schilder. He says, It is the peculiar, peculiar majesty of Jesus that he can conquer a man without man's first approaching him. But Satan's frailty is proved by this, that he cannot approach a soul unless that soul has first turned to him. You know, I know it's easy for us to defend our shoulds. I get it. But I just want to make sure we're choosing the greatest should. There are always things that we can justify, but it's a good thing. It's good, but is there a greater good? Is there a greater story to be told at New Life Church? Is there a greater story to be told in your marriage? In your community? In your workplace? In your life? Is there something worth choosing the greater should for? If you would just stand to your feet today. You know, I think this is a word that just causes me to step back and say, I just want to examine my heart. And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to close your eyes. You know, we all fulfill so many roles at work, at home, at church. Maybe that's a place where you started to grow a little bitter, a little tired, a little weary, a little frustrated. God, just remind us of the reasons why we do what we do. Remind us of the reasons. Maybe you've become someone that's been so focused on the rules. They should, they should, they should. He should, she should. My spouse should, my kids should. My husband should, my wife should. That you're feeling so let down. And today you might say, I want to choose relationship over that. I want to choose the greater should. Or maybe you're somebody that says, man, I've been short-sighted. I've been choosing this quick reward. I've been choosing the here and now. I've been choosing what's right in front of me and not what's eternal. You know, I want us just to have a minute to examine our hearts. And for you to just commit to the Lord, I want to guard against that bitterness. I don't want to be so short-sighted that I think it couldn't creep into my life. I want to guard against it. And so I'm going to ask Brian, if you would, just to lead us in a song. And as he plays, you can worship, you can pray. But really, I'm going to encourage you just to talk to the Lord about the condition of your heart before we close today. You know, there's such a freedom in choosing relationship over rules. There's such a freedom in focusing on the reasons instead of just the role. There's such a freedom in choosing what's eternal. Because guilt and condemnation of this life washes away. Other people's expectations wash away. What you should have been, could have been, should have done. See, those are lesser shoulds than the greater should, which is today I choose Christ. And when your heart is focused on that, there's such a freedom from bitterness and regret and condemnation and guilt. There's such a freedom in realizing that what God has for your tomorrow is greater than whatever lies behind. So I'm going to ask if you would just to agree with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you did for us. For the love and the mercy and the grace that you so freely give. Lord, we pray for your forgiveness for the times that we've taken it for granted. That we were more like Judas than we care to admit that we betrayed you. By not forgiving others, by walking in offense, by holding ourselves back. Lord, we pray today for a release of faith and mercy in this house that each one would say deep in their soul, I'm choosing a greater should. I'm letting go of what was. I'm looking ahead towards the prize. I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on eternity that this earth is not my home. And I choose the greater should of honoring you, of forgiveness for those that have hurt me, of walking in your anointing and your power and compassion for the lost. Lord, today we choose the greater should. And we commit our lives to you fresh and new 
that you would have your perfect will accomplished in all things through us. God, we thank you for each one here. We pray a blessing on them as they leave on their homes, on their workplaces, on their finances, on their relationships, that the glory of the Lord shines around them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.